normal people, right? That's right. Out of your garage, you can create a multi-billion dollar corporation. Uh -huh. I just had dinner with one of the people who invented Skype. Uh -huh. Out of nothing. Out of nothing. He said, oh, let's put video on the internet and created a billion dollar corporation just in a few years. So there's tremendous opportunity for people to jump into this game. Whole new areas, co companies, revenue that you can create if you dare to challenge uh, the status quo. Mm -hmm. So you are co-founder of the uh, string field theory. Mm -hmm. You were into heavy physics. And you popularize science as well. You write bestsellers. Mm -hmm. You were into TV series. You give interviews like this one. Mm -hmm. uh, are you criticized uh, in the scientific community? It used to be that way. Uh, Carl Sagan did a lot of television. Mm -hmm. And some scientists said, ha, that's, that's popularization. That's uh, demeaning. Uh, scientists don't do that. But times have changed because the Cold War is over. The governments are not going to give us money to build big machines anymore because there's no more competition with the Soviet Union. And so many of our machines are canceled. Uh, the, the machine in Switzerland, the Large Hadron Collider, we had a bigger one in America, the Super Collider. It was canceled in 1993 because we scientists cannot tell the taxpayer why tax money should go to support our work. Now, scientists are saying, yes, yes, please get on television. Tell the taxpayer we need science because there's no more Cold War. It's sad, but the Cold War helped to finance science. We would go to Congress and say, Russia. Congress would get nervous and, and give us money. We can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Now we have to convince the public to finance science. The lightsaber, a blade of pure energy of incredible power. It's the most popular movie weapon ever. There's something about its glowing blade and distinctive hum that fascinates everyone. And I'm going to show you how to build one. Also, if you use a laser beam in sunlight, or you simply turn on the lights, the laser beam becomes invisible. Thinking back, I realized that when I was a child of eight, there was a moment of epiphany that changed everything around me. My elementary school teacher walked in the room one day, very somber, and announced to the whole class that Einstein had just died. That evening, every newspaper on the earth flashed a picture of his desk with the unfinished manuscript of his greatest unfinished work. I wanted to know what was in that book. It was like a detective story. I wanted to piece together who done it. I wanted to put together all the pieces. We now know that stars burn hydrogen because energy comes from matter by E equals mc squared. Now we want another equation just like that that could explain the Big Bang that could explain the universe of atoms and molecules. And that is, quote, reading the mind of God, reading God's thoughts, why he created the universe this way, why there was a Big Bang. We think that the answer lies in something called string theory, which is what I do for a living. That's my day job. We think that everything around us is melodies, music, vibrating in vibrating strings. So the universe is a symphony a symphony of tiny little vibrating strings. And we are nothing but vibrations of a string. But a perfect one, because many scientists are now talking about mistake and singularity. It's like the imperfection being the reason why we are here. So does it, this way of thinking contradict uh, the, the theory of, uh, of, uh, of everything? Well, it gets back to the question, did God have a mother? If God created the universe, then who created God? Well, if there was a Big Bang, where did the Big Bang come from? So we scientists have the same question. So if you take Einstein's theory that the universe is a bubble and it's expanding and run the videotape backwards, then it was a singularity. Mm -hmm. But a singularity is infinite. It's, it's, uh, it's nothing. It, it has no meaning. Infinite gravity, infinitely small, that's ridiculous. So we need a higher theory, a theory beyond Einstein. Einstein's theory breaks down. Einstein's theory says nothing about what banged, how it banged, why it banged, what happened before the bang. It says nothing about that. 
That's where string theory comes in. Because we now know that string theory takes us before the Big Bang. That maybe our universe was a bubble that bumped into another bubble. Or maybe our bubble fissioned into two bubbles, two baby bubbles. Maybe that's where the universe came from. And maybe we, gave, we, we will never answer those questions, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. And but so with the Large Hadron Collider, we hope to answer some of these questions uh -huh. in our lifetime. We may be able to answer the question, did God have a mother? Where did the Big Bang come from? You know? mm -hmm. Stephen Hawking said in a documentary uh, that there is likely, you know, alien life in mm -hmm. the universe, but communicating with aliens can be uh, harmful to human ha race. Uh, you've been to Larry King and you have discussed this uh, subject. I mean, uh, is, it, is it like Christopher Columbus coming to America with new germs and everything? Uh, Stephen Hawking, my colleague, scared a lot of people. But if you read his words very carefully, he said, if, mm -hmm. if there are intelligent people out there, if they're hostile and warlike, then we have to worry about them. That's a lot of ifs. But you see, we will, I think, make contact with an alien civilization in outer space. We have satellites looking, looking for Earth-like planets in outer space. We have radio telescopes listening for conversations from aliens in outer space. Sooner or later, sooner or later, we're going to pick up a phone call from an alien in outer space. But you know, the distances are so huge from us to the stars that it's very difficult to travel between stars. And if they can reach us, they are thousands of years ahead of us, sure. thousands of years ahead of us. And so I don't think they're going to want to invade us because there are plenty of planets with nobody on them with lots of gold, silver, copper. They don't have to take the Earth. They could take other planets out there. Is they're that advanced. So I think that uh, we're probably simply not very interesting to them. There are other things for them to do than to bother us. So maybe we are better off alone <laughs> by ourselves. So I think they're out there. I think there probably are alien civilizations out there. But you see, if you're walking down a country road and you see an anthill, do you go down to the ants and say, I give you trinkets, I give you beads, <laughs> I give you books, I give you learning? <laughs> no, you ignore them or maybe you step on a few of them. Yeah, sure, you if smash they, them. <laughs> yeah, if, if they're that advanced, they'll say, oh, let's leave them alone. They're, they're, they're too primitive to deal mm -hmm, with. Mm -hmm. So 2010, 2010, mm -hmm. that's where we are right now. What amazes you the most in science and technology at this point in history? If you take a look at the amount of knowledge we have, it's been flat for thousands and thousands of years, and all of a sudden, <laughs> it's skyrocketing like that. So we are on the cusp, a cusp of a time when we had very little science for most of human existence, and just within the last hundred years or so, this explosion has taken place. We're in the middle of it. So this is a great time to be alive. Knowledge doubles. Knowledge doubles every 10, 20 years. Go to a college library and look at how much knowledge was accumulated during the 1700s, 1800s, very thin. Now go to a library. It's enormous, the medical journals, the science journals, chemistry journals. So this is a great time to be alive. And it's a great time for people because this creates wealth. It creates prosperity. Million, hundreds of millions of people are now entering the middle class for the first time. And they're enjoying the, the middle class lifestyle for the first time. So this is a great time to be alive. So everywhere in the planet, because it's not equal, right? Not yeah. equal. But however, yeah. I think Brazil, for example, is really on the threshold of greatness. They, Brazil could be a major, major power in the coming years. Many countries right now, unfortunately, are falling apart. They speculated too much on real estate. They thought, ah, get rich quick. Well, <laughs> you cannot get rich quick. Their economies are collapsing now. But Brazil is intact. It has a strong economy. It has good natural resources. It has a manufacturing sector, a unified people, common language. So Brazil could become great, but there's one thing missing. One thing missing is high tech. Computers, the internet, satellites, and stuff like that. But Brazil could create, uh, by education, a whole new layer of people to create new transistors and new televisions and new computers and stuff like that. So I think that uh, Brazil is at a turning point now because of science. If it dares to reach out, it could become a world power.